Case 5. Death at 36,000 feet. On Tuesday, the 22nd of May, 1962, Dale Horn couldn't wait to get home to Independence to tell his wife Joanne his good news. He'd just been offered a job as a manager at the Emory Freight Office in Chicago. He waited impatiently to board the 8.35 p.m. Continental Airlines Flight 11 from O'Hare International Airport to Kansas City, Missouri. He wasn't the only one in a hurry. Geneva Fraley, travelling with her business partner, Thomas Dotty, almost missed the plane, arriving just as the stairs were about to be removed for the plane to begin taxiing down the runway. They made it just in time. Another passenger was not so lucky, as he was turned away at the departure gate and told that he had missed the flight by moments. All he could do was watch from the airport window as the Boeing 707-124 took off. Little did he know at the time that his tardiness had saved his life. The newly built Boeing, registration number N70775, was a model of passenger plane which ushered in the jet age. It could seat up to 120 passengers, but today there were only 37. They were all looked after by four stewardesses, Marilyn Blumquist, Mary McGrath, Martha Rush and Stella Berry, all aged between 20 and 24, and easily identifiable by their smart uniforms and red continental berets. This was their last flight of the day, and they too were looking forward to getting home. The highly experienced and calm Fred Gray was the captain, supported by First Officer Edward Sullivan. Both men had racked up a huge 40,000 hours flight time between them, much of it on the 707. In those days, it was common even on short-haul flights to have another crew member in the cockpit serving as second officer and flight engineer. Today, Roger Allen held this position, and he sat in the jump seat behind Gray and Sullivan. The crew complement was seven altogether, made up of the three pilots and the four stewardesses. This particular aircraft had been involved in a failed hijacking attempt the year before and the tyres had been shot out on the runway to prevent the hijackers from flying the plane to Cuba. If any of the passengers or crew were aware of this, they might have felt protected by the old lightning never strikes the same place twice rule. Had they known what would happen less than an hour later, they would have wished with all their heart to have been held up in traffic that day and missed the flight. The plane taxied down the runway and turned its nose to the heavens in an uneventful takeoff. The Continental hostesses chatted to the passengers, many of whom were commuting businessmen, as they checked that everyone was comfortable. Around 45 minutes into the 61-minute flight, Thomas Dotty got up to visit the rear lavatory. Captain Fred Gray was advised by Air Traffic Control, ATC, to fly at 28,000 feet, but just before they reached the Mississippi River, he spotted a storm on the horizon. All seasoned pilots know that thunderstorms are the nemeses of aircraft, so Gray proposed ascending to 39,000 feet to stay within the clear weather and avoid turbulence. ATC granted permission and the plane began to climb. The controller watched Flight 11 steadily rising on the radar in the vicinity of Waverley, Iowa. At 9.20 p.m., as it reached 36,500 feet, it suddenly vanished from the screen. The ATC operative frantically checked the other radar stations in case it was a glitch. It wasn't. The round dot representing Flight 11 had disappeared in the blink of an eye, and none of the sensors or control systems were picking it up. It was as if the plane had simply vanished from the inky black sky. ATC desperately tried to radio the captain, but the deafening silence told a horrific story. A call went out to the relevant authorities to advise them of Flight 11's last known position. Local police could find no evidence of a crash, but in the early hours of the next morning, the news everyone had been dreading eventually came. Witnesses in Unionville, Putnam County, Missouri, reported seeing a massive flash or fireball in the sky. 
Farmer Lester Cook and his son Ron made a heart-stopping discovery in their alfalfa field at around 4 a.m. They had seen the fire from their home and detected the unmistakable smell of fuel. They approached with a flashlight, apprehensively trying to work out what the twisted metal shape that had appeared on their land could be. The realization was gut-wrenching. It was obvious that they were looking at the sickeningly twisted wreckage of an airplane. Suddenly, they noticed another sound through the crackling of the fire. It was the moaning of a human being. They soon found 27-year-old Japanese engineering student Takahiko Nakano, who had been living in Illinois, sitting near a row of three seats completely detached from the rest of the aircraft, surrounded by scraps of burning debris and shrapnel. Ron later recalled, There wasn't a scratch on him. He wasn't hurt at all. No broken bones. He tried to communicate with him, but the man seemed disorientated. Somehow, he had survived a fall from 36,000 feet, and on the surface, he appeared to be in good health. Police and emergency services arrived and rushed Nakano to St. Joseph Mercy Hospital, now called Mercy Medical Center. But he died shortly afterwards from internal injuries. There were no other survivors. Dale Horn would never get the chance to tell his wife about his new job and there would be many other family members waiting anxiously at home for the news that would bring their worlds to a devastating stop. As day broke on the terrible scene, more detail became visible. Continental-branded napkins scattered the field, poignant in their mundanity. The cockpit was found, the three pilots still strapped in with smoke masks attached to their faces, blood and tissue fragments coating the insides. The oxygen hoses connected to the masks were damaged and the plane's landing gear was down. What could have caused the plane to crash land, having shown no prior signs of technical malfunction and with no distress calls made? The FBI commenced a full investigation, headed by William Mark Felt, who would later become known as the whistleblower in the Watergate scandal. Around 20 volunteers and FBI staff helped Sheriff David Fowler organize a search crew to begin a methodical search of the debris field, which covered eight miles. The flight recorder was recovered, and investigators were hopeful this could shed some light on the mystery. Despite the casing being damaged in the crash, the information was intact, but it gave absolutely no clue as to what had caused the disaster. Whatever had occurred had been sudden and unstoppable. The Civil Aeronautics Board transported the wreckage to a warehouse in a nearby town, and with the aid of a four-feet-high stack of Boeing construction manuals, they slowly reassembled the plane, a painstaking process which one of the searchers observed was a bit like putting a giant jigsaw puzzle together, but with far more at stake. One investigator noticed that some pieces of the fuselage were larger than others and that the fragments were getting smaller and smaller the closer they got to the lavatory. From this pattern, they deduced an unsettling truth. Whatever had caused the explosion had originated from that area. They were piecing together evidence of a bomb. Forensic technicians examined the toilet fragments and confirmed there were traces of explosives. Aircraft experts established that the bomb had forced the tail section to separate from the fuselage. The flight crew had initiated the emergency descent procedures and made use of the smoke masks due to the thick fog that would have formed in the cabin immediately after decompression. Once the tail had separated, the rest of the structure would have violently pitched downwards, nose first, which resulted in the engines being torn off, causing it to spiral uncontrollably. The fuselage of the Boeing 707, missing the back 12 metres, but with part of the left wing and most of the right wing intact, struck the ground with unimaginable force. Investigators now understood what they were dealing with, but the question was, who was responsible for the tragedy? 
The FBI pored over the passenger lists, checking names and running background and criminal record searches against them. They scrutinized seating plans and spoke to devastated families. Finally, they found a passenger with an interesting backstory. Thomas Dotty, who nearly missed the plane, was a failed businessman who hoped to breathe new life into his career by opening a home furnishings store with his business partner, Geneva Fraley. This in itself was not a red flag, but the fact that Dotty was due to be in court for a preliminary hearing the day after the flight undoubtedly was, on the charges of first-degree robbery and carrying a concealed weapon. They soon unravelled more of Dotty's actions prior to boarding the plane. He had purchased life insurance at the airport, which, although not uncommon in the 1960s before a flight, was in this case notable. He had taken out the maximum amount available, $150,000, worth $1.5 million today, and signed it over to his pregnant wife as the beneficiary. A sales receipt led investigators to an unusual purchase Dotty had made at a hardware store in Carson City, Nevada, a few days before. Six sticks of dynamite. The cause of the air disaster was now shockingly obvious. The bankrupt Dotty had made his way to the rear cabin toilet clutching his brown leather briefcase. In the privacy of the cubicle, he ignited the dynamite, put it inside a used towel bin, and brought down a $4.5 million plane with just $1.54 of explosives. It is not unheard of for someone to consider suicide in desperation, but it is unthinkable that Dotty was willing to take 43 other people with him. He had no way of knowing the total passenger count when he bought his ticket, and the plane could have been carrying as many as 120 souls. He must have considered the loss of so many lives an acceptable price to pay for his family's financial security. He obviously believed that his actions would never be uncovered, but he failed to reckon with the dogged investigators who built up the facts literally piece by piece and revealed the truth behind what he had done. Dotty's insurance policy was voided as it was proved beyond doubt that he had committed suicide. His wife received a refund of the original premium, totaling just $12, and faced the prospect of bringing up her five-year-old daughter, an unborn child, alone, in the knowledge that her husband had committed mass murder in a grotesquely misguided attempt to provide for them, and in doing so had the dubious honour of becoming America's very first suicide bomber. Ever since this tragedy, life insurance companies have added a clause to their small print to make it clear that they will not pay out if there are any signs of sabotage on aircraft. The revelatory debris pattern of a bomb, as witnessed in the Dotty case, became essential reading for air crash investigators. Usually, Flight numbers are retired after a fatal crash, but Flight 11 continued to operate until 2009, although on a completely different route between two cities in Texas. This flight path was eventually renamed Flight 33. Continental Airlines merged with United Airlines in 2012. In 2010, a memorial was erected near the crash site in Unionville, funded by donations, and in May 2012, a 50th anniversary memorial service was held. The land is now leased by deer and turkey hunters, who may be blissfully unaware of its sombre past. Apparently, the Flight 11 crash was the inspiration for Arthur Haley's 1968 novel Airport, which was made into a movie two years later and is often cited as the birth of the disaster genre. It featured an all-star cast, including stalwart of disaster flicks George Kennedy, the multi-talented Dean Martin, B-movie champ Van Heflin, an Iowa-born actress, anti-war advocate and civil rights activist Jean Seberg, who later died under unusual circumstances a few years later. A story for another time and another book perhaps.